making noises. Uh, just for the record, as we get started, I did take my gum out before I got up here, uh, un unlike your pastor. Um, that, but that's one of the many reasons why I love James. Uh, he's not afraid just to take it out and put it in his pocket. I mean, you know, he's, he's secure in who he is, and maybe it's because he's got big biceps and he doesn't care. Um, but that's one of the reasons why I love him. And, and I always joke, he's got the biceps, I got the hair, all right? And so, um, but for real, uh, it, it is hard to overstate, uh, I don't think I could, uh, how much I love your pastor, uh, how much he is a brother, uh, not just a friend, but a brother from another mother. And, um, you know, we both have brothers, and uh, we've talked a lot about our relationship uh, with our brothers, and, um, you know, and, and God is just so gracious to just bring you more than one brother, and uh, it's just amazing to me, like he said, how our stories are so intertwined uh, and so similar. Uh, I mean, literally, I became the lead pastor of Revolution Church uh, January 1st, 2010. He became the lead pastor uh, in January of 2012. Um, and so we always just joke, we're literally like two years ahead of Crosspoint uh, in so many ways. Uh, and the crazy thing is, when James was a student pastor at Westridge, uh, during the time of transition, when our founding pastor left, and I think it was like six or seven months before I came, James actually came and spoke quite often to Revolution Church. Um, so much so that people thought he was going to be the next lead pastor, uh, and even told him that. And uh, I'm very grateful that he wasn't the next lead pastor of Revolution Church because obviously God uh, brought my family from Texas, uh, one of the greatest countries on earth, and um, <laughs> to Georgia. It is an independent republic, by the way. We can secede from the unit at any point in time. And, um, but what was, what was amazing to me is God knew then what he was getting ready to do in James' life. Uh, and was preparing him then for you. And, and not only am I grateful that he didn't take the job there, but I'm so grateful that he took the job here um, and just how our lives have been so intertwined. Um, because you need people in your life, and I don't know if you have people like this, but you need people in your life to help you understand that you're not insane because you feel insane, right? Uh, and that's what leadership does to you. It makes you, I, I never forget when I became a lead pastor, one of the first things I did was I called my old lead pastor and it's like, I'm sorry. I am sorry. It's like when you become a parent, right? You call your parents, or at least you should have if you haven't, that's your move tonight, all right? You call your parents, you're like, I'm sorry. Like, I had no idea that you put up with so much. And, um, and so James is just that guy in my life. And now that our churches uh, literally are sister churches and working to plant churches together, um, with Westridge. It's crazy. I mean, Revolution was the first church plant out of, out of Westridge, and I think this church was the second one. Um, and it, just all those crazy things, just amazing. I don't have time to even get into. But I just want you to know that your pastor is the real deal. And um, he is truly uh, not only a great pastor, but a great husband, a great father. Um, and you are so blessed. And so let's give James some credit, some honor tonight. Uh, thank you, buddy. Oh, man, but it's a privilege to be here with you as well, because just as much as I love James, I love Crosspoint. And uh, again, I believe, and, and I felt this way when I came to Revolution, that what God was going to do with Revolution was bigger than Revolution. Uh, it was bigger than, than just him going to resurrect the church and what he's done. And I feel the same way about Crosspoint, that what God has done here is bigger than you. Um, and he did what he did here to not only show off his grace and what he could do in you, but now what he could do through you. Uh, and so you are such a testimony, whether you realize it or not, uh, you are such a testimony to this community about God's grace, God's power to resurrect and to change things. And so thank you for being you as well. You really are an incredible church. If you have a Bible tonight, you can open up to Matthew chapter 20. That's going to be our main text. Um, and we're going to hit a few verses. Uh, first, before that, I'll start with Mark 10, and it'll connect together and then a little bit in Luke um, but I've been watching what God has been doing here over the last several weeks um, because I was telling James, I, I don't ever like to go speak at a church where I don't understand what God's been doing there already. And so I wanted to make sure I was in the flow of what God was doing. And so I've been watching the messages over the last several weeks. And, and I got to tell you, man, I love this concept 
uh, this, this, I was just telling James, the, this idea of moving, leaving the table for the floor. Um, because to me, it, you know, a lot of times with churches and, you know, and we do our best to cast vision and to help people understand where we're going and what we feel like God wants us to do. Um, and sometimes it can be big and grandiose and it's about vision, you know, and, 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 and especially student pastors, we're weird. We try to make everything cool, but we're not cool anymore. Like once you hit 25, you're no longer cool. All right. And so if you're 24 here tonight, 25 is over the hill. All right. I just hate to tell you, uh, it's coming. And, um, but what I love about this is it's heart. This, this series and this initiative that you're in is heart. It, it's not about, uh, it, not that it's not about grand vision, it is, but it's, it's coming from a place of, of heart and then out to your hands. And so I love this concept. And, and John chapter 13, you know, the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet is incredible. And, and I'm going to help us understand in John chapter 13, I, I hope, um, you know, it's, and James mentioned this, that's the only gospel that mentions this story of Jesus washing feet. It's the only one of the four. And some people look at those inconsistencies that they feel like sometimes in the gospels, like, well, this one talks about it and this one doesn't. Why? And, and they're trying to accomplish different purposes for different things. And, and sometimes they'll tell the same story from different vantage points. And, and I'm going to kind of point out some of that as well. But I think there's some specific reasons as I was really digging into John chapter 13. Uh, and, and this is really kind of my take on it, just from, so I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not going to write a commentary about this and take this to the bank. But, but there's a, some specific reasons why I think John is the one who tells this story. I think John says this story in John chapter 13 for some very specific reasons because he was highlighting Jesus' example and what he had to learn in somewhat the hard way about Jesus' example. And so we're going to give you a little background, hopefully, out of Mark chapter 10 and mainly Matthew chapter 20 as to why that story is in John chapter 13. Uh, and, and I have a little tradition before we get into the word. I always want to pray and ask God to bless our time together. All right. So would you pray with me? Then we'll dig in. Father, we always want to stop and acknowledge the fact that we are here not only by you, but because of you and for you. Um, and so, God, we want to put ourselves underneath the authority of your word um, and recognize the fact that this is your revealed word to us. You have showed us yourself for the purposes of understanding how you love us. And so, God, I pray tonight as we open that your, your word, that your Holy Spirit would do what he does and illuminate the word and, and, and help us to see if we can't see, help us to hear if we can't hear. Jesus said all the time, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. He who has eyes to see, let him see. But God, we can't do that without the Holy Spirit. And so now would you fill us with your spirit as we open your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 20 tells a story. And like I said, I'm going to get to that in just a second. But it tells a story about James and John. You know, James had a brother and they were called the sons of Zebedee. Zebedee was their father. And it tells the story of James and John's mother coming to Jesus and making a request of Jesus. But then in Mark chapter 10, again, this is one of those places in the Bible where people are like, oh, oh, see, this doesn't line up. In Mark chapter 10, it tells us that it wasn't Jesus, or it wasn't their mother that makes the request, that it was actually James and John themselves. So in Mark chapter 10, you got this story of, of the sons of Zebedee coming to Jesus. And then in Matthew chapter 20, you got the story of the, the sons coming with their mother to Jesus. And we can look at that, and, and people, you know, have different opinions as to why that is. Maybe this is the same story, but they're just recording different aspects of it. Maybe Mark didn't point out that, that their mother was there. Maybe Matthew did. And, and I think that's viable. But, but honestly, if I'm kind of just thinking about this from a human standpoint, and, and again, this is just my opinion, but here's what I think that happened. I think in Mark chapter 10, James and John did it themselves, and they got an answer that their mama didn't like. You know what I'm saying? And then mama's like, I'm going to go handle this. I sent you all to go ask Jesus this question, and you didn't handle it right, and so I'm going to go handle this. 
And so in Mark chapter 10, let's just kind of set this up, and then we'll get into Matthew chapter 20. Mark chapter 10, they are on the screen, verse 35 through 37, it says, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, him being Jesus, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. What a crazy statement. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? Verse 37, And they said to him, Now listen to this, Grant us to sit. Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Now, we read that, and again, through the context of, we can't look at the Bible without looking back through history and understanding the cross and resurrection and everything that Jesus was doing. But you have to understand, at this point in time, from the disciples' perspective, the cross and suffering, all of that is completely out of their mind. In fact, it it blew their mind that Jesus even talked like that. And so in in their understanding, Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that the the Old Testament said. He is the king. He is the one who's going to restore the kingdom to Israel. And so we look at their statement and we think, man, how arrogant are these boys? Like they come up to Jesus and like, hey, we want to sit at your table in your glory. And I would like to submit to you, it wasn't necessarily a, a bad request, Because again, at least they came to Jesus, at least they recognized Jesus' authority, they recognized who he was, what he was doing as, as, you know, exemplified by his miracles and all, they knew he had power, they knew he had authority, in fact, Jesus called them to be disciples. But so often we read the the gospels and we look at the disciples, and I don't know if you ever think like this, you'd be like, how how stupid are they? (laughs) Well, apparently pretty stupid. In fact, when you read other stories in the gospel, the Bible says that they were common, ordinary men. Literally, I kid you not, and I love languages, which is funny because I hated English growing up. I love math. Two plus two equals four. I don't care how you feel about it, all right? But I have to write, and I have to write my feelings. I don't like that. And so, but now as a pastor, I love words, and I dig into words. Literally, where it says that they were common, ordinary men, the Greek word there is the word idiotos. It's where we get our English word idiot. For real. So Jesus called some idiots. So, sorry, this is like the spit zone right here. Any, uh, any Gallagher fans out there, you know what I'm talking about? Like, this is kind of, you should have wore some plastic, all right? Um, I get excited about Jesus. So, and so, again, we have to understand that they're just doing the best they can. They're asking a question. And it's not that their, their question is evil or wrong. Well, Let's just say it's not evil, but it is a misunderstanding of actually where Jesus wants them to sit. You know, James has been talking the last several weeks about moving from the table to the floor. It's interesting to me that their question is, grant us to sit where? At the table. Now, you can talk back with me as long as I ask for it or if you get excited about that stuff. That's cool, all right? I like for you to, to call and respond. I'm a student pastor. It's still at heart, all right? Uh, one of these days, I'm going to grow up. And so it, it's, an, it's interesting to me. And, and, and honestly, I can, I can understand a lot about the disciples because I do the same things. I mean, they're humans, right? So they come to Jesus and they want to sit at the table. They want to sit at the table in his glory. And here's what I've realized all of us do. All of us want to sit at the table. And and Jesus invites us to the table, right? That's what communion is about. He reclined at table and they took the Lord's Supper. So it's not that Jesus has a problem with inviting us to his table, but he just doesn't want us to just sit at his table. He wants us to move from his table to the towel. You know, I find it interesting. I don't know if I've ever met a person. I've been in ministry now for over 20 years. I don't know if I've ever met a person that just begs God for the towel. They always beg God for the table. Right? And, and it's, again, it's okay to come to the table. It's just not okay to stay there. It's okay to pull up a seat at the table, but, but at some point you have to understand that ultimately what Jesus is calling you to is sacrifice, is to move from the table to the floor. 
Now let's get into Matthew chapter 20 because we're going to see this kind of unpacked some more. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 20, now we get Matthew's version of events and we see their mother involved. It says, Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to up to him with her sons and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Say that these two sons of mine are to sit. Again, same kind of idea. One at your right hand and one at your left hand in your kingdom. Jesus answered, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? And they said to him, we are able. Now, again, a little context. Let's stop here for a second. James and John are the sons of Zebedee because that's how they would name people back then. They would give them a first name and and either some kind of name to their father or from where they're from. And so that's how they were known, James and John, sons of Zebedee. But Jesus actually gave him a nickname. It's one of the reasons why I love Jesus. You know you like somebody when you give him a nickname. And his nickname that he gives them, maybe I know sons of what? Thunder. I love that. Sons of thunder. Why in the world would Jesus give them the nickname sons of thunder? Because these are some rednecks, man. <laughs> these are some country. These are my people. Right? I mean, I joke about this all the time if you've been around, but I'm, I'm, I'm a redneck who went to school. It's crazy. I mean, I'm so redneck, my parents are cousins, and I'm not even joking about that, all right? <laughs> For real. My dad's from Arkansas, too. It's crazy. And, and so I, I get that. These are just some good old boys that, that when Jesus calls them to ministry, when he says, I'm going to make you into disciples, they're all, all about it. There's another crazy story in Luke where they go into a town and, and, and they, some people respond to Jesus and James and John don't like it. And literally, this is what they say to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, you want us to call down fire and destroy them? <laughs> that's in your Bible. So that's who these dudes are. And so their identity is one of fighting. I mean, Jesus calls them sons of thunder. And so Jesus says to them, are you able to drink this cup? What is this cup? This cup is one of sacrifice and surrender. It's not going to be winning through fighting. It's going to be winning through serving. It's not going to be winning through strength. It's going to be winning through weakness. And that's the context that I think leads to John 13. So let's let's continue what happens. Jesus says to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and my left hand is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. He's like, listen, I'm not here to say where you're going to sit. I'm here to say, this is what I'm calling you to, which is to serve. And then it says, and when the 10 heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. Now, before you think that the other 10 were more holy, You want to know what they're mad about? They're simply mad not that the other two asked or that mama came and showed up and asked. They're mad that they asked first. Literally, this word here, indignant, is the idea that they're not enraged that they asked. They're mad that now they think since they asked first, they're not going to get a seat. They're jealous. And so Jesus, being Jesus, says, okay, hold on, boys. (laughs) Let me help you understand what we're doing here. Let me teach you something about this move I'm, I'm about to make and I'm calling you to make. And listen to what Jesus says. But Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give. To give his life as a ransom for many. So I want you to think about this. We have two different instances. Mark chapter 10, Matthew chapter 20, where either it was two different things, one it was just James and John, and then the second one their mother was involved again because she didn't like 
You know, she's like, I got to handle this. Or it's the same instance, but either one, I think, changed John's perception. And that's why I think John is the one who at the Passover in John 13 highlights Jesus' move. Because it struck him so much because he had at least one, possibly two encounters where he heard Jesus say to him what he should do. And then he saw Jesus do it. And so what I think we read in John chapter 13 is an evidence of John's perspective change. John is no longer asking Jesus to sit at the table. He's asking Jesus to serve with a towel, which is interesting because John, we know just from history, was more than likely the last apostle to die. He was tarred and feathered, tortured, sent to an island to be all alone. And he wrote the book of Revelation because he understood the move that Jesus made and he understood the move that Jesus was calling him to make, to go from the table to the floor because John finally understood that true greatness was not defined by being sons of thunder. It was defined by being Sons of surrender. The kind of men that are willing to redefine greatness, not by lording over, that's an operative term, but by serving from under. See, Jesus says, you know the rulers of the Gentiles, that's how they do it. Now, you need to understand this word ruler It's the same idea that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 6 where he talks about we don't fight against flesh and blood, but we fight against principalities and rulers in the heavenly realms. What Jesus was helping them understand is like, listen, there's a spirit behind every authority. There's a spirit behind every authority that you see on earth. There's a power. There's a ruler behind it. And the spirit of this world is going to say to you that true greatness comes from exalting yourself. True greatness comes from you having people serve you. That's the spirit of this age. And that comes straight from the enemy. And Jesus is saying, not so with you. Because that's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to lead you to go a different direction. Not exalt yourself, but humble yourself. Humble yourself. A few years ago at our church, we did a series, and and, and as pastors, it's weird. We read the Bible, and we think in series. We think about talks, and, and I was reading this passage one day, and the word servant just jumped out at me because, again, it's an operative word. And I thought, man, what's the opposite of a servant? And then the word tyrant came to my mind. And I thought, all right, tyrant, servant. They both end with the same three letters, which is what? Ant. So then I thought, I got a series. And we did a series several years ago called Ants. And it was a series on leadership. And and here was the tagline, which ant are you? Are you a tyrant or a servant? Because Jesus says that's the only two. There's tyrants and there's servants. So what is a tyrant? Here's a very quick definition. I got it here on the screen. A tyrant, and you'll know the A is capitalized, and now you'll know why. It's not a misprint. Tyrants are those who see life as others serving them. Tyrants are those who see life or leadership or whatever it is as others serving them. See, so many of us. In fact, I would say all of us, we are born into the world with tyrant mentalities, right? I mean, as much as as parents, we would love to say that a child's first word is mom or dad, but what is the first word? Mine. And if it's not first, it's right there. 
Any parents here? Did you have to teach your kids how to say the word mine? I didn't. They're like the seagulls from Nemo. Mine, 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 mine. I didn't have to teach them. I didn't have to sit them down and teach them how to be selfish. I didn't have to sit them down and, and help them know how to get me and mom to serve them. They just came hardwired with that. And that's sinful nature. You're like, oh, he's my angel. No, to the rest of us, she's the devil, right? Like it's... <laughs> And so as, ki- as parents, our job, by the grace of God, is to help our kids make a leadership change, a lordship change. You're not the point. Jesus is. And, and this is why, I, I, again, I, I don't want to knock on their mother. Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. And, and again, I, student pastor forever. So I used to talk to parents all the time about having 2020 vision for your kids. Matthew 20, 20. Well, this year is 20 what? And let's just, it's not 2020. Can we just, it's just 2020, all right? Let's just, it's easier on everybody. We just agree to that now, all right? 2020. Listen, as parents, I hope you have a vision for your kids. And, and I hope the vision is based upon Matthew 20, 20, where you are taking your kids to Jesus and you're kneeling before him. Of, of raising kingdom kids. I want to raise kingdom kids of God's kingdom, not the world's kingdom. And, and so there's things that I do as a parent to help my kids understand. Listen, I love you, but you're not the center. Jesus is, and that's good news. And, and so I, I have to teach my kids, just like you have to teach your kids to help them understand. One of my favorite things, and this may sound weird to you, is to teach my kids about tithing. You want to know why I love it? Because we'll sit down. My son just started a new job at Chick-fil-A. Come on, somebody. Like, mm. Texas, it's Whataburger. George is Chick-fil-A. I'm all in on both. So we'll sit down to eat Chick-fil-A or wherever it's at, and we get the meal. And here's what I do. And you may think I'm a cruel parent. I just think I'm godly. <laughs> Before my kids eat a fry, they give me a fry. The first bite goes to dad. And, and, and I love it because their response is, but dad, it's. And then we back up. Okay, hold up. Who bought that? <laughs> I love it because all y'all about to do this with your kids, right? Like, <laughs> and I'll lovingly, no, those are my fries. Those are my chicken nuggets. That is my cookie. That is my, I know you're fasting. I got to quit. All right. So we just got through our 21 days of prayer and fasting. We just book it in by, from the national championship to the Super Bowl. Everybody hates it, but I'm like, you got idols. All right. And so uh, we just came off of that. But here's why I want my kids to understand that. There's a God and it's not them. And, and, and here's what's crazy. Now that they know this, they just know it now. Now that they know, hey, dad gets the first 10. They know that the love, when, when I don't have to ask for it, they just understand that it's mine. What does it do in my heart towards them? You want another meal? You want, you want more? Now, we've done giving initiatives and stuff. This is what's crazy, and I'll talk more about it. I've been married 18 years. In 18 years of marriage, I've done six giving initiatives. Six. So when we're talking about sacrificial giving, I'm with you, bro. I understand it. But I love it with my kids because after they tithe to me, then sometimes I'll take more. And they're like, wait, we already tithe. I'm like, now we're talking about sacrificial giving. <laughs> <laughs> But here's why. I'm trying to do you a favor and not raise tyrants. I'm trying to do the world a favor. And and, and we would all love it if you would take this on too. Do us a favor and not raise tyrants. Not raise kids who think that life is about others serving them. Why? 
Because that's not the spirit of Christ. That's the spirit of the Antichrist. That's a different spirit that's self-exalting. This is what's crazy about Jesus. Jesus is and was and forever will be the son of God. But you want to know his favorite title for himself? You, you just saw it, son of man. Jesus didn't show up and be like, listen, y'all, I'm the son of God, S on my chest. Y'all need to listen. His favorite title for himself was son of man. It's a fulfillment of Ezekiel, but it's also him understanding rightly that it was only his job to humble himself. You want to know, this is crazy, you want to know why Jesus didn't struggle with sin? This is my thought. Because he humbled himself before sin had to. He humbled himself. He lowered himself before sin had to, because that's the role of sin. And this is what's crazy about God's kingdom and God's grace. God even uses sin as a way to humble ourselves to show that it's all by grace. Even faith is a gift. So Jesus is teaching them something, not so with you. There's another place in the Bible in Luke, and I got it on the screen as well. You don't have to turn to it. But Luke chapter 14, Jesus tells a parable. Verse 7, listen to this. He said, now he told a parable to those who were invited. Now listen to this. When he noticed how they chose the places of honor. In your Bible, you may have the subheading of the parable of the wedding feast or the you know, the one that's to come. But Jesus, it says, he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, verse 10, but when you are invited, go and sit in the what? The lowest place. Go and sit in the lowest place when you're invited. Why? I don't know if you ask questions like this of the Bible as you read it, but you should. He answers. So when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, now don't miss this. <laughs> it's almost like there's a God. <laughs> friend, what's the next word there? Move. move. Y'all been talking about move here lately? Move up what? Higher. higher. Move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. Verse 11, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be will be exalted. Listen, the kingdom of God is an upside down world. The way up is down. Strength comes through weakness. Winning comes through losing. Greatness comes through serving. Tyrant or servant? Here's the servant definition. Servant, those who see life as them serving others. A tyrant is one who sees life as others serving them. A servant is those who see life as them serving others. My friends, there's only two positions. Tyrants sit at the table and say to everybody, serve me. Servants sit on the floor. They take the lowest position and they put on the towel and they humble themselves and God exalts them. You want to know why Jesus is exalted to the highest place? James talked about this out of Philippians. It's because he went lower than anybody else. He didn't just go to the floor, he went under the floor, he went into the ground. Now, they didn't do burials like we do, six feet under, but you get the point. And Jesus was saying to his disciples, not so with you. And I think John, the son of thunder, who was ready to call down fire on somebody, was so marked by the move he saw Jesus make. That he thought to himself, if he made that move for me, he came from heaven to earth for me. And if I got his spirit in him now, I'm going to make the same move. And my life now is going to be about serving others and giving. 
as a ransom for many. You know, James has talked about leadership here, has talked about this initiative, and, and it's so much more than just giving. But it's not less than that. It's, it's first seeing yourself as a servant. And again, when you see yourself as a servant, out of that flows all the things that God commands servants to do, to serve, to give, to sacrifice. But here's the problem, and I'm just, let's just be honest. You want to know why most of us don't take the step to make that move? It's because everybody wants to be a servant until God treats you like one. <laughs> Everybody's like, oh, I want to tell, as long as everybody honors me for it. There's been so many times in my life where I'm like, God, I'm your servant, and then God treats me like a servant. I'm like, what are you doing? I thought you wanted to be used by me. I mean, there have been so many times in my life where I have committed, and, and I'm just going to be honest with you, when you make a commitment this Sunday, it's not necessarily going to go easier for you. But I'm here to tell you it's worth it. Literally, at the end of last year, we just finished our two-and-a-half-year giving initiative. That's what I'm like. We're literally like two years ahead of y'all, everything. It's crazy. We started at a campus two and a half years ago. Now, I mean, it's just crazy. I'm just In March of 2017, again, we were in a giving initiative. I started, um, sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to say I started. I, I, I was praying about, Lord, what do you have us to give? Because in this... We've been through six giving initiatives. Like, my entire marriage has been leaving a giving initiative and going into a giving initiative. I've sold two houses for it, different times. And I don't say that as a way to brag. I just say that it, it only makes sense. And so in March of 2017, my wife and I, Lindsay, we made the largest financial commitment we have ever made, over and above. Two months later, now, I, I'm trying to finish early. Well, not, not early, but it was the band's fault. It's never the pastor's fault. All right. <laughs> but, but I want you to hear me here. Two months later, I got a notice in the mail, and I was being sued. It was from a real estate deal I had done a, a few years earlier. And that was a Saturday I got the notice in the mail. I had to go to the Cherokee County Jail inside to get the paperwork for this lawsuit, like this thick. I already felt like a criminal. Like, I just have a guilty conscience all the time. I just assume it's always my fault. And I'm sitting there reading through this paperwork. And you want to just guess how much I'm being sued for? The exact same amount that I had just committed two months earlier. Exact same amount. And that was the floor, not the ceiling. And I'm sitting there two months after making the greatest commitment of my life, and, and I'm, I'm the pastor? It, it, it messes, people are like, pastor, everything goes for, well for you. No, it doesn't. <laughs> the dude in the front takes the most spears. And here I am as a pastor leading our church, and I'm like, what have I done? What have I done to my family? What? Have, what? How is this going to happen? And that kicked off a chain of events in my life for two years where it was so hard. I ain't going to lie to you. This is where James is like, bro, don't tell them all this because they're not going to give now. But my wife and I made a commitment. We made a commitment to the Lord. And we never stopped giving. We never stopped during that time. And in November of 2019, two and a half years later, finally settled the lawsuit. Thousands and thousands of dollars and I thought, Lord, how are we going to do this? Again, we were so committed to it. Last summer, we sold our house. 
sold our house. I don't need a house. I got a mansion. I live in an RV. My wife's just crazy like that. On our first date, I told her, if you're not willing to live in a hut in Africa, don't marry me. And she didn't leave. So I'm like, all right, let's do this. Because my life belongs to him. It's not a question of if. It's only a question of how much. And this is where people are like, oh, pastors, you church, you pastors, y'all just want people's money. You know what I say to people now? No, we don't. We actually want way more than that. We're not that shallow. We don't just want your money, your time, your talents, your heart, everything. Why? Because it's worth it. Here's what's crazy. Last year, December, we finished the lawsuit. By God's grace, I don't know how. We met our commitment. And two weeks later, two weeks later, through a miraculous series of events, we got paid back for everything that we had paid in legal fees. Everything. And I'm here to tell you today, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy, but I'd do it again. Because there's nothing more important than the kingdom of God. If I can be a servant in his house, I'll take that over being a tyrant in my own. I'll make the move. Because Jesus says, if I make that move, then he'll move me up. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Listen, I don't know about you. I don't want God opposing me. I don't want him opposing me. I'm going to lose. So I might as well get in on his plan. But here's what's crazy. When I get in on his plan, I get in on his provision. When I get in on his plan to make a move, and I'm willing to sacrifice and, and give, then I get the resurrection. But you don't get that without death. See, we all want the title at the table, but we don't want the towel on the floor. And I'm just here to tell you, man, you will never regret making that move. You will never regret making that move. And so as we wrap this up, I just want to encourage you to honestly think, I mean, you got now until Sunday, and James didn't ask me to do this, but I just know what it's like to be a pastor. Y'all got bracelets on. What's your move? And I want to encourage you. It's your move. Which ant are you? And depending upon which ant are you will determine which direction you move. But if you'll move down, you'll have the God of all creation on your side moving you up. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace in our life. Thank you that none of us have a seat at the table because of our sacrifice, but because of yours. So I thank you for my brothers and sisters here at Cross Point. We are one church working together in the kingdom of God, sacrificing and giving our life as a ransom for many. God, you loved us so much that you gave. And so, God, I pray that we would have your heart and we would make the move in the same kind of way because that's the example that you gave us. Not only are you our Lord, but you're our example. So help us to move and to be a servant and to see our life as here to serve others, knowing that you are faithful to meet every need, And if we will humble ourselves, you will exalt us. You will move us up higher because you've got the power and the ability to do so. So I thank you, and I pray that you would bless this weekend, not just from a financial standpoint, but from a heart standpoint, that everybody would get in on this move. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
otro.